The Shroud of Turin is not a painting. It is, uh, it cannot even be denied. The Shroud cannot be a painting because it breaks almost every rule of nature. And when natural law is broken, that's it. And le hmm. let me tell you why. Everybody, every layman thinks that a painting is paint particles on some surface. No. It is paint particles tied together by some kind of liquid, and that goes on the, on the surface. And as long as that liquid is completely continuous, you see a continuous image, and that is a painting. The minute the, the liquid is uh, hurt, missing, parts of it missing, or entirely miss missing, it cannot be a painting because it is against natural law. Hmm. So as long as we, you see a continuous image, you have to have an absolutely intact, continuous paint film. And that's, that's the, the very important thing, the, the liquids which carry a painting. The shroud has an absolutely continuous image. There is no interruption, and there is not one bit of liquid <laughs> dyeing material on it. This is a nonsense. This, nobody can paint like that. Such a painting does not exist. It cannot exist. What got you interested in the shroud? How did you, I mean, I'm looking around the studio and I would call this sacred art for lack of a it's better. Sacred art. It's sacred art. And it's like I said earlier, there's a, when you walk in the door, you just feel um, a I don't know where they use the word supernatural peace, but you feel a supernatural peace when you walk into what I would call a modern day sanctuary. Oh, um, it is a, in essence, a church, a place of assembly. There is a, a sacredness here. What got you involved in the shroud? When did you first view it and, and what piqued your interest? Well, believe it or not, at the age of two, I already was doing drawings. At the age of 11, I won national first prize with my painting. At the age of 14, I painted in the Vatican. So it, it, my career came so early, and I would say that from the age of six or so, I really almost was drawn to this road. I really felt that this is extremely important, not only from the religious point of view, but from the scientific point of view, because some new kind of science opens through this world. Uh, one of the most noted skeptics, I won't mention his name, but people will know who I'm talking about, uh, once told me that, oh, you know, um, th all that work of the stirrup team is the rantings of believers. It's very simple, if you don't understand the science, that past a certain point, somebody throwing the science at you, you stop and you, you're not qualified to challenge the science, so you attack the scientist. And that's this particular skeptic's normal technique. And he always then throws the religious card out. But he can't do that with me because I'm Jewish. Okay, if I have an instrument, say a spectrophotometer, I'm taking a reading off of a piece of cloth. When I push the button to take that reading on the instrument, do you think that instrument cares whether I'm a Christian, a Jew, or a Muslim? or a heathen, it doesn't care. The data is the data. So if you don't like what Stirp's conclusions were, go to the peer-reviewed science, study the data, come, come up with your own conclusions, but it's there. And well, nobody else has done that but us. The sedarium of Oviedo is a cloth that has blood on it that is preserved in Oviedo, Spain from the seventh century. When overlaid with the shroud, apparently we see that there are points of congruency. Well, the, the sudarium is, uh, it not only has blood, but has other fluid stains, uh, probably from the nose and mouth of the victim that the cloth wrapped. There's little doubt that it was a face cloth, the kind of cloth that would have been wrapped around the face of the man of the shroud, assuming that it was him. Um, and 
To this day, our custom is pretty much everywhere in the world, if somebody dies, say uh, an accident victim, the first thing you do is cover the face. So the same thing would have been true uh, even in the first century, that the, out of respect for the dead, you cover the face. The interesting thing about the, about the sudarium is it, it does have provenance back to about 7th century. It also has these blood and fluid stains that when compared to some of the blood stains, particularly those at the back of the head on the shroud, there does seem to be a very kind of congruency that does exist. I don't know about the number of points and I don't know that using a technique usually applied to fingerprints is appropriate for image analysis. You mentioned on my radio show that a million pound donation was given. Uh, tell us about that. I guess the real irony of the whole carbon dating business, since we're talking about it, is the fact that uh, after the three laboratories ultimately did their testing, published their results in uh, uh, Nature, a radiocarbon article, um, Oxford Laboratory received a one million pound, British pound sterling, anonymous contribution for debunking the shroud. Uh, interestingly enough, Dr. Tite, who was from the British Museum, left the British Museum, came to Oxford, and some of that money built him a nice lab at Oxford. And, and look, you know, if, that's, if the order of events is as I've stated them, and that happened after the fact, then okay, well, so be it. But when did these three labs find out that this contribution was coming. Did they have any foreknowledge or forewarning that this was the case, or was it a big surprise to them that came two months after the dating was released? Now, of course, if, if they didn't know about it, no harm, no foul. But if they knew about it, if they knew this contribution was gonna come, depending on what they found about the shroud, had to be for debunking the shroud, then, I question the entire process. Everybody looks at the two images like this, for instance. Two separate images which have nothing to do with each other, it seems like. Hmm. And nobody thinks of it that they were on both sides of the shroud and they were wrapped around a figure. So they were not flat, they were wrapped around. So what does that mean? You look at it, why is it so separate? Why one would not influence the other? The other, right. And then you realize suddenly, heaven's sakes, we never noticed it, that there is a, a horizontal um, object, which we never noticed before, going through, which slices the shroud, the shroud body, into two halves. One has nothing to do with the other. What, what is the, the single phenomenon which can cause that? We, we are dealing with two event horizons. Hmm. And we are already a little bit familiar with event horizons, only they are a little bit different than the Schrodt's event horizon. The event horizon is an object which when you approach, it cuts space-time into two halves. One you can know up to a point which you are approaching from your side. But there will be a point when you cannot do anything anymore what is behind it. The last photon would hit it, the last time quanta will hit it. And after that, nothing. For all practical purposes, time and space have stopped. Is that correct? We are very close to it. And I will explain that. Okay. The, this too is... So the body, the body laid laid like this in the tomb. Yes. Just like we see it on the shroud. Yes, yes. But suddenly at the event, it began to levitate. Yes, the, the gravity was defeated the second law. Then time and space stops. And, and there is a total, for the first time in the history of the universe, there is a total time collapse. 
and even nature with the, the scriptures kind of hint at it that strange things were happening. That was the moment when time stopped. When, when time stops, the very last information it had, it would project on, on the event horizon on both sides. And when finally we have no event horizon, it releases its secret that there was a, a Big Bang type singularity. There is an explosion which cannot be described. Hmm. The universe would have stopped existing if somehow it would not have been cut to a very, very minimal time. And that's why we see on this shroud an unknown thing which looks like burn, but it's, but it's not. not. In 2002, the clandestine, is the only word I can use, restoration was done without consulting any scientists, just a small group in Turin took it upon themselves, although I must admit they got Pope John Paul II's permission, but I'm not too sure that by then John Paul knew what he was signing or even, or even if he signed it or perhaps the Secretary of State might have signed it. So it was done ostensibly with his permission and they removed all the patches and they removed the backing cloth and they scraped all the burned stuff away and they vacuumed it and they used steam in areas to get some of the creases out and it's now seven centimeters longer and they virtually eliminated the possibility for a lot of science. discuss people all over the globe looking up and seeing what appears to be two suns in the sky. Then we have Dr. Roger Lear. Why is it that